My name is Michael Portillo and I'm half Spanish. And for that reason, I was exhilarated to discover that a really important collection of Spanish paintings has hung on the walls of Auckland Castle for the best part of 300 years. On top of that, there is now a Spanish gallery in Bishop Auckland, bringing together really important works from Spain's golden age. I know that I shall be a very frequent visitor in years to come. I've come to Bishop Auckland today to speak to the moving spirit behind the project, Jonathan Ruffer. Jonathan, I had no idea that Bishop Auckland had this wonder. Auckland Castle is really Auckland Palace. Yeah. Uh, is an amazing thing, isn't it? And we're approaching in the formal uh, driveway to the entrance. Jonathan, this is extraordinary. Uh, a walk through the castle is one superb room after another. Where are we now? At the very heart of things, I think. This is uh, the centre of it all. This is the throne room. And the reason for that is that these weren't just ordinary bishops, they were prince bishops. And uh, that's the only time in uh, England that that title has been given. And it was because um, King William wanted to create a power base, his man in the north of England. And this is where he came for it. But you've made the point these were men of power, also of wealth, and in one particular case, a man of exquisite taste, who made an extraordinary purchase, Absolutely. which I'm very interested in and longing to see. Very good. Well, the next room will reveal all. What an extraordinary set of pictures. They, I mean, they clearly are a set of pictures. They're clearly by the same hand. And yet so much variety in them, so much variety of costume, of face, of activity. Bishop Trevor, I imagine he's the man there, uh, he bought them. And, and what, they've been in this dining room for getting on for three centuries? That's right. Certainly 270 years, in a way. Now these are by the Spanish artist Francisco de Zurbaran. I'm half Spanish, uh, he was from Seville, I have a house in Seville, so that's my interest. But take up the story. Well, the fascinating thing is that in the 18th century, nobody had heard of Zurbaran. So when these were bought, they were always known to be by him. But um, it was a real case of who he. It was only in the 1930s that the uh, scholarship on Zurbaran included these pictures. The more we get into the story, the more wonder there is in it, quite honestly, that these remarkable Spanish paintings, uh, an almost complete set, should turn up in England, mm. that they should be bought by an Anglican bishop, that their subject matter should be jury, uh, specifically the foundation of the 12 tribes of Israel. Put all of these things together, this is almost unbelievable, isn't it? And yet it happened, and these pictures have been here for nearly 300 years on these walls. And that's why I've come to Bishop Auckland. There was a moment when it seemed the paintings might leave Bishop Auckland, be sold, and you raised a flag, you protested and you stepped in. Why? I uh, uh, felt very strongly that um, the, the North doesn't get the same deal um, as the South. And here, were, uh, here was something that's absolutely part of Bishop Auckland and the North East legacy, and it needed to stay put where it was. And I was looking to come uh, back uh, to the North East to um, do regenerative work, and it seemed to me that, that seeing the pictures stay here was like a flag up a flagpole. It was a way of saying, I'm going to do what I can. It might all turn out to be a futile gesture, but I'm going to do what I can. And building on, I mean, the genius of Bishop Trevor and the accident of history that these paintings were in Bishop Auckland, you want to establish a permanent connection between the town and Spanish art. That's exactly right, Michael. Mm -hmm. 
Jonathan, on the wall is a well-known saying, Quien no ha visto Sevilla, no ha visto Maravilla. If you haven't seen Seville, you haven't seen a great wonder. And by the way, the skyline is still recognizable, particularly the cathedral with its magnificent tower, La Giralda. And this was the city, Seville, that brought us great art. It was indeed, and that's the story that we tell here. And why did all that great art come to Seville? The answer was that that's where the money was. And we have painted on the floor here uh, the way that that money arrived. It came through the river and uh, all the glories and the wealth of South America came up this river into Seville. And um, when I think of Seville, I think of Bishop Auckland because Bishop Auckland had some glorious times in um, uh, the, the, the 19th and early 20th century. You only have to look at the building we're in. Um, it, it was a great place to live. But post-industrial uh, malaise, it's not like that now. Now Seville, to me, is a great example that a city can come back to what it was. And that's what's going to happen to Bishop Auckland. <laughs> Jonathan, we're in a room called Cabbages and Kings, and indeed you have royalty on the walls, but you've stood me in front of a dog. Why? The dog is a, a, a wonderful parable for how Spain was. The, 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 the Spanish people were preoccupied with eternity, and yet wherever they looked, they found transients. And that's the story of the... Uh, uh, Spanish royal families. The, the interbreeding weakened the bloodlines and they found it very difficult to produce heirs. And why we're looking at this dog is because the, uh, it wasn't just the, the royal family, the royal pack suffered from the same thing. Their bloodlines weakened. And this was an attempt to bring new blood into the royal packs. And this splendid lady who came from the Pyrenees, had none of the royal uh, uh, blood of the pack in her, but she was never used because they weren't sure of her pedigree. So that's the parable. I can imagine that when visitors begin to arrive here, having heard your explanation, they'll be standing in front of this picture of, of the dog. They'll be telling each other the story. They'll be showing off because otherwise you might not come to it. But I might also say that in the same room, you've got magnificent paintings of the royal family and absolutely superb still lifes. Jonathan, I recognize here the symbols of the Spanish kingdoms of Castile and Leon, and something's going on in the heavens here. It's an allegory. Can you explain it? Yes, I can. It's. Um uh, a, a marvellous uh, demonstration that in Spain, uh, where there was theology, there was politics as well. And this was an attempt to bring St. Teresa, uh, the gal on the, on the right, uh, into the position of being the patron saint of Spain alongside Santiago. And there was a huge tussle about this. And eventually the Pope said, no more, she can't come, not invited. And uh, he ordered that all images be destroyed. And this one, uh, because it was painted by the king's painter, Maino, wasn't destroyed. Wow. So this is unique. A wonderful survival. Unique, so I mean, even the brother in Madrid wouldn't have this sort of painting. No, absolutely not. Uh, and. Uh, and does that imply that you are hoping that scholars of Spanish art will come to Bishop Auckland from, from everywhere? It certainly does. We have things here that nobody else can see and they want to see. Uh, Jonathan, the collection of Spanish art here is much bigger, much more varied than I'd imagined. We could have gone to many different spots, but you brought me to this particular corner. For what reason? Uh, the Golden Age of Spanish painting didn't come from nowhere. 
it came from a series of different sources. One of the least understood is the part that Caravaggio played. Caravaggio is now a household name, but his importance was that he had a very different way of expressing what art was. He took very ordinary things and painted them with great theatricality and great truth. And that had a great influence on people around him. And the people who were around him were Spanish and they were Italians who happened to go and work in Spain. So if you want to see the first wave of influence of Caravaggio, then Spain is the place to see it. Now you've pointed out to me, I can see that these paintings are influenced by Caravaggio. I mean, in particular, the lighting is very mm. like Caravaggio. But I think a lot of people would say, look, if we want to see Spanish painting the best, mm. we will go to the Prado Museum in Madrid. Why go to Bishop Auckland? Well, the Prado has a collection beyond measure wonderful. But you come here to hear a story. The Spanish Golden Age is not just pictures hanging on a wall. It's a story of what Spain was, what they thought, what they cared about, expressed uh, in a brilliant and creative way. And that's what we do here. We tell a story. Jonathan, you have many large and dramatic paintings here, but you brought me to a small one. And one that to me doesn't even look classically like the Spanish Golden Age. But you'll have a good reason, no doubt. This, Michael, is the picture that I'm most proud of introducing to Bishop Auckland. It's painted by somebody who is not at all a well-known name, Navarrete El Mudo, uh, Navarrete the Deaf and Dumb. And the reason is that he was the father of Spanish Golden Age painting. And he painted only for King Philip II. And so nearly all the pictures that survive are in the Royal Collection. And I only know of three pictures uh, that he painted that are not in the Royal Collections in Spain. One of them is in the Prado, one of them's in the National Gallery of Ireland, and the other one is here. And so this is a real present to Bishop Auckland, because I think this picture uh, will bring people uh, to this collection to see whether this claim that he was the father of the Spanish Golden Age is true or not. But he's enormously important and here he is. You're making a big claim here. Not just that this is a nice collection of Spanish paintings in Bishop Auckland, but there, there are things to see here that cannot be seen easily anywhere else in the world. That's absolutely right. We're telling a story here. We're not simply putting pictures on the wall and inviting uh, uh, the audience to think they're marvellous pictures. And if you tell a story, uh, you have to bring things to people's attention which aren't necessary when you're simply hanging pictures on the wall. And so what I hope is that the story sings out that the Spanish Golden Age was such a remarkable time and that the legacy of it is one to be treasured. And that's what we have tried to do here, and I hope uh, that those who come will see that that's true. Jonathan, this, I just cannot believe, an El Greco in Bishop Auckland. It, is it real? It certainly is. El Greco must be the most recognisable of Spanish painters, perhaps of all painters. His style is so unusual, unique to him. And you have a genuine El Greco here. Congratulations. Uh, we've been very fortunate in uh, the acquisitions that we've made, but this is a, a world-class picture and we have it in Bishop Auckland.
Jonathan, this is, this is sublime. We are on the top floor of an old bank building in Bishop Auckland, and we are transported to Spain. Terracotta floor, Moorish arches, carved wooden ceiling, the tomb of a bishop. This is a miracle. Well, I'm glad you like it, Michael. Jonathan, in these rooms, we've moved away from painting and even actually antiquity. You wanted to take us to Spain. Why? Spain has a magic which, unless you're actually there, you can't feel. So what we have tried to do is to bring to Bishop Auckland the magic that is Spain. And um, I want to tell you a, a, a story uh, that happened in New York when um, uh, Queen Sophia uh, had a small dinner party and she asked the few uh, uh, guests that she had um, what bit of Spain did they most love? And Jacob Rothschild, bless him, said the bit of Spain that I most love is a small part of the northeast of England and what we are trying to do is to honour that thought that when people come here, they are in Spain.